Hey everybody, this is take two because we had a technical difficulty on take one. I'm Emily Moyer. Robert Phoenix is with me. This is Matrix Mash. We are back after a few weeks off. Robert, how you doing? I'm great, Emily. Thanks for having me and uh, really looking forward to diving in. Psychic diving. <laughs> Not psychic driving, psychic diving. Psychic I like diving. That. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. All right. So we've been gone for a few weeks. Robert and I have both been traveling and taking care of some personal things and whatnot. And we missed all the big hullabaloo, but you know, we've been chatting in the background and I developed a theory pretty quickly about what was really going on here that Robert and I have been talking about. So we're going to dive into it today. So should we hop right into, should we psychically dive into psychic driving? Let's get right to it. Psychic driving. All right, guys. So as this uh, Russiagate Mueller thing came to an end, although I don't think it will actually ever end, I was kind of left, you know, wondering what to make of all of it. And I started to think about you know, we've been exposed to this, whether we wanted to be or not, for the last three years. And pretty early on, I felt there was something wrong with how many times we were hearing the words Russia and Trump and collusion. And we had heard a similar thing several years back with ISIS, but it didn't last quite this long. And I was starting to wonder, is like the point to just expose people to the vibration of those words? Like, I wonder what those words look like on a, frequ on a frequency generator or whatever, right? Is this doing something to people's minds? And then I started to wonder if this was like, some kind of, you know, if we played a drinking game, everybody would be dead. But, you know, I, I kind of got to this space where um, I knew there was something about that, but I didn't, I hadn't put all the pieces together. And then a few months, like maybe a month ago or whatever, just a little before the Mueller report came out, I saw this video of Rachel Maddow saying the word Russia 12, to, like 1,200 times in the same episode, right? Like literally tw about 1,200 times. And whether you like her or not, agree with her politics or not, there was a time when she, at least came across as an intelligent person, somewhat able to you know, distinguish fantasy from reality and you know, facts from fiction and whatnot. And clearly that is not where she is any longer. And I started to go, what could really make somebody's you know, mind split like this? And I had been witnessing this for the past few years with my father, who's a very intelligent man, but he is under this Russian Trump collusion, mind control, Mueller report, whatever this bullshit is. He's definitely under it. He hasn't left the TV in three years. And I started to think about some of the stuff I, you know, came out across in my early research on MKUltra about 15 years ago was that psychic driving technique of you and Cameron, who we've discussed briefly on this show before. We've talked about Jordan Peterson coming from McGill University, but you and Cameron was one of the early MKUltra doctors and he, you know, created this technique known as psychic driving, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about it. Um, psychic driving was a psychiatric procedure of the 1950s and 1960s in which patients were subjected to a continuously repeated audio message on a loop tape to alter their behavior. In psychic driving, patients were often exposed to hundreds of thousands of repetitions of a single statement over the course of their treatment. They were also concurrently administered muscular paralytic drugs, such as curare or curare, to subdue them for the purposes of exposure to the loop messages. The procedure was pioneered by Dr. D. Ewan Cameron and used and funded by the CIA's Project MKUltra program in Canada. So from that description right there, that sounds like exactly what we've been witnessing. You take the psychic driving, the loop messages, and then you combine that with the condition that people are living under with chemtrails, with psychiatric drugs, with pharmaceuticals. Or mind you, those are also advertised in between the loop messages about Russia, Trump, collusion, all that kind of stuff. You know, and the general state of people's poor diet. So they're basically drugs sitting there on the couch listening to this loop tape over and over about Russian collusion, right? Uh, and you're hearing it not only on CNN and MSNBC, but also Fox News, even though it's from a different perspective. And then, you know, from outlets that are supposed to be slightly alternative, like, you know, NPR or the Young Turks or Democracy Now!, we have been exposed to nothing but this for three years now. And I'm wondering, you know, what the uh, new behavior that they're trying to get out of people is from this. Because at this point, people have been separated from their rational mind. And I propose that depatterning has happened, which is the other procedure he's known for. Psychic driving procedure was a chronological precursor to Cameron's depatterning, the latter involving massive doses of electroconvulsive therapy combined with similarly large doses of psychedelic drugs. The intent was to break down the subject's personality. Theoretically, psychic driving could then be used with some efficacy in establishing a new personality. So 
I think we're there. I think the frequencies and 5G and all this other stuff we're exposed to could, you know, count as the electroconvulsive therapy, right? The things in the air, the food, the, the pharmaceuticals, they're, they're the uh, psychiatric, you know, the psychedelic drugs. So many people are on meds. We're here, but this mass- So many people, mass- and, let's, let, and let's not forget that there's been a real push and wave to legalize cannabis. Yep. We have yep. large numbers of people now that are, that are smoking mm-hmm. cannabis, and cannabis that's altered, yes. cannabis that's really powerful, super super powerful so i mean if you if you add it all up you've got a wide spectrum of of potential kind of psychic chargers Mm -hmm. from from like if you want to be live a clean life want to be straight or whatever you're 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 going to get hit you're going to get hit from the chemtrails you're going to get hit from fluoride you're going to get hit from the frequencies it's going to happen right have you you, you even heard of how they're treating some of this new uh this, this high, high, these strains of marijuana, some of them are, be tre- are being treated with sound to increase potency and to bring out certain elements. I, somebody showed me an article about this recently and I was like, wow. So yeah, that aspect of it for sure. And it, it's funny, I was just, you know, when we had our first go round, our first take before we, you know, that we lost a minute ago, I talked about, I, I was sure about my theory when I saw Chelsea Handler on Bill Maher this past week. Uh, talking about how she suffered a, an identity crisis and deep depression after Trump's election and through this, you know, whole thing, you know, now this collapse of the Mueller report, you know, hopes or whatever, how people, you know, it's like his show has become uh, A, in denial of reality. People are, you know, talking about, well, we don't need a Mueller report. Like, all I need is a TV to know there was collusion. And basically, you know, almost being like a support group for people who can't believe that this is, you know, this has happened. And his audi- he, well, he and his audience are all, you know, big for the pot legalization kind of things too. So they're exactly the people that this would have worked on if we're talking about pot as the possibility of the psychedelic drug involved. Very interesting, Robert. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, all the elements are there and the psychic driving is, and, and by the way, it's not just Russian collusion. There are other things that are going on right now. Another big psychic driving force happens to be the word white privilege. That's right. another one. Mm-hmm. And we're getting hammered with this again and again and again and well, again. White privilege, white, white, uh, white nationalism, um, uh, you know, just the, all of these sort of like, you know, politically divisive racial terms. You know, right. they're all used over and over again. There's not, um, I, we've never seen, I mean, I, the news was not like this 10 years ago, right? No. Like, I, mean, I guess the first time we ever heard anything remotely like this was like with the O.J. Simpson, just the, the amount of times you heard that on the news. But it wasn't these terms, right? These terms that are just repeated over and over and over again. Like, when was the first time we heard that? Was this, I mean? Well, I think probably you could go back to the 70s and um you know watergate nixon watergate nixon watergate nixon i mean that was on a loop in the 70s it was inescapable well and then we had it in a supposedly more positive manner during the obama year like hope and change when he was running for president we heard that over and over and over open change hope and change hope and change right Yes, absolutely. And that also, I mean, that was a psychic driver because people got really snowed by who and what Obama actually was, right? Like they got snowed into thinking he was one thing. They got snowed in and then snowed. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, and, you know, another thing that a lot of people seem to forget, and I think actually plays a significant role, is the fact that they got rid of the analog spectrum. So if you go back to what was going on in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even the 90s, you would have a TV antenna that was up on top of your roof, and you would receive an analog signal Mm -hmm. from a TV tower, and it would come into your antenna, and your TV would pick it up, decode it, and you would have an analog TV. Cable comes along, and begins to slowly move away from the analog model. Then eventually, the FCC basically says, we're disbanding the analog spectrum, everything is going to be digital moving forward. More effective for mind control. Well, not well. the analog spectrum did not go away. Mm-hmm. It's still there. 
And my, my gut feeling is that they're sending signal through the analog spectrum that, that we're not aware of. Now, we are bioacoustic beings. We're analog beings. You know, we, you know, we are biomagnetic, which is why, you know, when records were theoretically popular, they were so popular because the way that sound is captured is that somebody's playing an instrument, it goes on to a reel-to-reel -reel tape, mm -hmm. right? And then that reel-to-reel -reel tape has a magnetic band. And mm -hmm. what it does is it captures the emotion of the performance. Mm -hmm. and that magnetic band is then transferred ultimately to an acetate plate. And that acetate plate roughly carries the same emotional frequency that was emitted through the performance of the musician. And then after that acetate is created, then the wax poppies with all the grooves that goes, you know, right out to, you know, the, 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 the retail space and onto your turntable and that needle hits it. And so what we're doing is we're having an analog experience. When, when digital came along, what happened is that got disrupted. Mm -hmm. You know, when we listen to music now, we're listening to an approximation of emotion. So when that analog transmission was ended for broadcast purposes, my gut says is that they've been using that analog spectrum to drive frequencies. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that we would pick them up emotionally. Gotcha. And this is a whole other level of psychic driving. Yeah. And, and, and in a way, so I'll, I'll give you an example. When I used to watch Bush on TV, or Bush too, right? I hated the guy. I really hated him. Yeah. Like I, I mean, I don't hate a lot of people. I hated him. And I would watch his press conferences and his little talks in the White House garden, the Rose Garden, and I would feel oddly sympathetic towards him. <laughs> right. And I'm like, why is this happening? I mean, yeah. I mean, rationally, I don't like this guy, but emotionally, I'm feeling oddly sympathetic towards him. And that's when I realized that something was going on. Huh. And not and not in the same way, like, because uh, he wasn't quite the master of NLP that, like, Obama was, right? Like, yeah. my cousin once told me, she's like, I can't help it. I just love listening to Obama talk. I love it. He was using NLP. George Bush didn't have those same levels of gifts. So that emotional sympathy that you're talking about is different than the sort of mind control one comes under from, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this gets into the movie They Live. And oh, that's one of my favorites to talk about. Right, so when, so the backstory of They Live. the apartment building from They Live. <laughs> so, so, you know they have, what was it, Channel 27 or whatever it was? Yeah. Right, right, that's where the signal was coming out of. Right. That they were broadcasting a signal that interfered with the ability to see these, yep. you know, these, these creatures mm -hmm. from, from this other dimension, this other planet. So what we're talking about here is not too far afield. So I think that there's multiple levels of psychic driving. Mm -hmm. there's psychic driving that's going on with, you know, 4G, our cell phones, Wi-Fi, all that stuff. There's like psychic, so we're to like, you and Cameron's psychic driving is like, a psychic driver like a regular driver and what you're talking about is like the psychic driving of a driverless car there doesn't even it, it, it's not broadcasting a particular message it's broadcasting a, a frequency to convey feelings and emotion right right, right. Yeah. now if most people i think in our world here our network are familiar with hilda clark and hilda clark was a pretty radical healer mm -hmm. and, she figured out that there was a frequency for every disease, every disorder, every virus, and every emotion. Mm -hmm. right? So if they wanted to, they could find that one frequency and then they could drive that through the analog spectrum. Yeah. So if people wanted to feel disturbed or anxious or angry or whatever that was, right, yeah. there's a frequency that exists for that. Yeah. And, and that can, that can be clearly transmitted. I mean, perhaps not clear, but clearly there's a case that can be made for that. Interesting. I wonder, sometimes I wonder about stuff like that. Like if they even treat like chemicals and drugs with that, right? Like, so I have this, um, I have a love tuner 
And it's like this little whistle that blows a 528 frequency, right? Mm -hmm. And the first, how I found it was I was in this juice place that I go to near my work sometimes. And this girl had on this cute necklace that had a little thing. On. I was like, oh, what's that? She's like, oh, it's a love tuner. And she blew it. And I immediately, like, it felt like the world was hugging me from behind. Right. And if you think about it, like ecstasy, that's some sort of some of that kinds of feelings that people have when they take ecstasy for the first time. Right. So we know that these chemicals create that. But I also believe the drugs are programmed. So I wonder if they treat some of these drugs with frequencies like that to embed emotion beyond what that chemical reaction can create. Right. Yeah. I mean, I that's a that. that's a that's a big leap. But I don't think it would be that far afield. I mean, if you go back and like listen to the stuff that John, you know, John Todd, you know that guy, John Todd, very strange figure. Um, he, he was a preacher, but he comes out of this kind of satanic world and yeah. yeah, the satanic world connected to rock and roll. Is, uh, so yeah. he, he has this kind of unusual sort of stretch where he becomes, you know, kind, kind of popular and talks about the evils of rock and roll. He gets into stories. Yeah. He gets into stories around certain cuts of music mm -hmm. and, and how they would actually do like rituals and, and, and cast incantations and spells over certain tracks. Oh, well, I mean, absolutely. I mean, and certainly like my experience and, you know, with certain music and tracks being, you know, mind control triggers and whatnot. Right. It's all, it isn't just about like that trigger in the way people think of it it's also about creating the emotional state for whatever the trigger on the song is going to be right like the song makes you feel a certain energy it makes you feel a certain way and then you hear the words or whatever or, you know make whatever associations to sort of send you into alter absolutely yeah and, and yeah. let's just you know take that model of taking a certain frequency mm -hmm. and then embedding it subliminally underneath the track yeah and you know that that goes on i my sense is it goes on fairly often all the time because these people are very sophisticated yeah. with what they do with sound. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're switched on and sometimes in a very... So I wanted to play a clip from a movie that I think captures this zeitgeist of psychic driving. And it's one of those sort of, you know, hidden in plain sight kinds of examples of what psychic driving looks like. All right, let's hear. Let, let, me, let me cue this thing up, and you, when you see it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. All righty. So here we go. Let's do this. Can we pop it open? Give me one second here. Make sure that. Uh, let me just start from the beginning, and let's get into a little share screen. One of the features I absolutely love about. Uh, of Zoom. Yep. Oh, Don't forget to hit, hit that sound thing on the bottom I showed you too. All right, hold on. You know what? Let me go back. Hold on. Let me do the uh, let me do the stop share. Give me one second. Hold on. Let's go back here and uh, share. Here and then the bottom left. Ah, there it is. Okay. Yeah, let's just so we have clean sound on the share. Yeah. All right, let's do this. Here we go. And this is the uh oh, get out of here. Cancel. And here we go. So this is, this is psychic driving in a cinematic vein. Creative use, uh, yes, uh, fair use purposes here. I don't hear anything. It's okay, you don't need to. Okay, cool, perfect. Just watch it. Yeah, but yes, this is exactly it. So this is a clockwork orange. Mm -hmm. And the film itself is kind of, the trailer is kind of psychically driven. Yeah. It, you're getting the synopsis of the movie in a very quick section. Okay, here's where the psychic driving comes into play. You can see Alex, who's beaten up and goes through this reprogramming. So that's that's a that's a minute's worth of mm. intense yeah. intense cinematic montage yeah. cuts, and then there, there are oh, hold on a second. So there 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 are moments 
in there where you see where Alex, who's played by Malcolm McDowell, um, they have his eyes pinned back. Mm -hmm. and he keeps having drops put in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And he sees visions of horror over and over and over and over. Scenes from World War II, the Holocaust, people being beaten up, and it's interspersed with images of pleasure. Mm -hmm. So that everything gets jumbled up and confused. So pleasure becomes pain and vice versa. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, so the experiment is that when he gets out, he theoretically is, uh, you know, redeemed or, or he, he's, you know, he's, he's healed, you know, and, but what happens is every time he goes to engage in one of his old activities, whether it's sex or something that, you know, turned him on some kind of violence, he has a violent reaction to it. Yeah. So, so it's a very interesting kind of hidden in plain sight sort of version of the psychic driving that we're talking about. And of course, Kubrick is right there kind of spilling the beans. Yeah, Psychic Driving. So when did that movie come out? Uh, Clockwork Orange came out in the 70s. I think it was around 76, 77. About, right about the same time that MK Ultra became discovered, at, you know, with the, with the, you know, hearings in Congress or whatever, right? Where like the basic public facing side of MK Ultra was outed for the first time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Around the same time. Mm -hmm. there, there's another movie that I think hints at uh, Donald Cameron in Psychic Driving. It's a movie called Scanners. And it was directed by David Cronenberg. Yeah. And now what's interesting is that Donald Cameron is Scottish. Mm -hmm. And the Scots have a really weird connection with the kind of new behavioral models. Mm -hmm. you know, we talked about this on my show on, on for last Friday with Tavistock and the second wave of researchers from Tavistock essentially coming from, coming from Scotland. Mm -hmm. So there's a very strange connection between, you know, this, this kind of Scottish intellectual. Isn't Glasgow like one of the first smart cities? I think their city is all already wired up with 5G and the internet of things to the point where like they have uh, internet embedded in like the, 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 the street lights and things like that, right? Like, yeah, I, I yeah I'm not sure, but that's the, that's the plan. Yeah, I think Glasgow is already up and running with that. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that the character who plays the doctor in Scanners is Patrick McGowan. Ah. And he's a Scot. Mm -hmm. he's so interesting. McGowan, you and Cameron, they got the you and going there. <laughs> very interesting. Yeah, and Patrick McGowan plays these roles over his film career that are very interesting. Yeah. And of course, he's probably most famous for playing the role of ultimately number one in The Prisoner, which is a, an amazing Tavistockian kind of series about mind control, replace memory, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, th that period in, in, in on the BBC between The Avengers mm -hmm. and, and uh, The Prisoner, it's mind blowing what they're what they're basically oh, showing. Yeah. I'll have to do that. I love, you know, I find that sometimes more interesting than particular movies, watching the, looking at somebody's career and looking at the film choices that they've made or the, the, the things that they've been in and then say, look, going back and saying, okay, what is this person trying to tell me? Like for me, one of my favorites to look at the course of his career has been Val Kilmer and the film choices that he's made. What is he saying? Everybody should go take a look at the course of his career and pay particular attention, not only to the really big roles he's been in, but some of the smaller roles and what the point of those movies were and the whole story is right there. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, he, he's, he, he's in one of my favorite movies. It's a little kind of noir film called Kill Me, Kill Me Again. Val Kilmer? Yeah. He, and I've, it, I've never seen that, but um, he was in that movie called um, Salt and Sea. Mm -hmm. And he was also in the movie The Saint, right? Right, and right. And the, and the Saint was, was basically being shown right around the same time mm -hmm. in England as The Avengers and mm -hmm. uh, The Prisoner were. And yeah. of course, the saint's name is Simon Templar, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, he's, he, he's a Templar. He, he, he belongs to, you know, he's, he's a Knights Templar Freemasonic figure. Yep. Yeah. And it's about cold fusion, right? And, and then he, he was also in this movie called The Salt and Sea, mm -hmm. which is 
really interesting. There are so many layers to that movie, and that is really the truth about a lot of what is going on. And and you, he was in The Doors. He was in Batman. He's you know like if you really look at you know all the kind of strange stuff he's been in, and then you know how he's personal life has been really up and down he's had health issues he hasn't and of course he went to the same high school i did <laughs> right and then andrew barshaga went to right so yeah he's a very interesting character about val kilmer and it, you know like i find many um many things in common with him but those small i mean we all know him from his big movies and whatnot but those small movies he's been in there's a lot there this is a guy who you know either if he's being guided it's you know, very interesting, or if he's choosing these, what is he really trying to tell us? Who is he really? Yeah, he was also in the island of Dr. Moreau. Yeah. And, and that had to do with uh, chimeras and hybrids and, you know, these bizarre experiments that were going on. And Marlon Brando was in that film as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, have, I, have a, I have some personal anecdotal stories yeah. ah. that, were that were told to me about Val Cameron from people on set, but I'm not, I'm not gonna share them. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not uh, not pertinent. Anyway, yeah, he's an interesting character, and sometimes we can look at people in their films, mm -hmm. and there is a story and there's a thread. And McGowan is is one of those guys, and 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 I do believe that David can't that that uh, you know the film was uh, directed by David Cronenberg, mm -hmm. Canadian. Okay, so I think what, he, what else has he made? David Cronenberg has made some uh, other. Well, he made The Fly. Yeah. Oh, and, these are all mind control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of my favorite movies of him is, is *The Brood* with um, with Oliver um, Oliver Reed. Uh, but he, you know, he's the ma he's one of the masters of modern horror. Yeah. Really, really visceral. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's got. If you have the stomach to watch some of his movies, yeah. Uh, you know, they're not always easy to watch. Yeah. He did this one called *Existence*, which is a very strange film about wet wear and kind of you know neural jacking and. Ah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he's another one of these guys that seems to be kind of kind of a, a storyteller, gatekeeper. Yeah. You know, he has a little bit of information, a little bit of insight, some of which he's probably operating on intuitively, some of which he's probably being fed. You know, he also did this um, very interesting film called, um, I think it's called Eastern Promise. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's with um, v Vigo Mortensen. Oh, he, another interesting character. Yeah, which is right. So, and he, he did two films. The other one is A History of Violence. Yep. Eastern Promise is kind of interesting because he gets into this whole narrative about who's Russian and who's not Russian. <laughs> and, which and, leads us right back to Russian collusion. <laughs> right. Right, exactly, yeah. Very interesting. Do you, like, let me see if I can figure out a way. Did you ever see those, I think I've heard you talk about them, those videos of Yuri Bezmenov? talking about oh, yeah. uh, you know that how, how russia would in uh, how the soviet union would basically infiltrate overtake and demoralize the american people and you know sometimes i wonder if that's what we're looking at and people are so focused on this like layer of russian collusion that they think exists that like underneath that there really could be russian subversion going on but oh, i think there's a i think there's a big game going on yeah i think the russians are deeply involved yeah, uh, I don't think uh, for one minute that the uh, that, that the communist regime mm -hmm. went away. It just yeah. became more corporatized in some ways, yeah. more stratified, uh, a little more statist. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think it's been going on for a long time, and I think it's. Well, if you want to watch Yuri Bezmenov? Go watch the videos of Yuri Bez Bezmenov talking about demoralization and infiltration. Yeah, it's a big deal. It's a it's a yeah. it's a really big. Now we have this guy Alexander Dugan. Mm -hmm. who is the high priest of sort of the alt-right or the new right. And, and, you know, and Dugan is, you know, kind of a, a, an occultist as well. Mm -hmm. You know, so he, he spent a lot of time on Alex Jones and a lot of people on, on the far right really like him. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think he's trustworthy at all. Alexander I, Dugan? Yeah, I think he's a dark mage. Hmm. I, 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 I know the name Alexander Dugan. I, for some reason, didn't think he was a modern figure. I thought he was a figure from before that people in the certain factions of the alt-right were sort of revitalizing. I, I think I was, uh, I mean, actually, Masaki and I, I feel like we were talking about this when we were talking about this guy named Joaquin Flores, who's kind of an interesting guy, but I feel like he was saying that he's into Alexander Dugan. 
Maybe yeah, no, Dugan is this strange kind of, you know, liminal figure, shadowy. Looking at him up right moves, now. Moves between worlds. Yeah. And, and um, you, you know, he's kind of connected to that replacement theory manifesto that was, uh, that was used in the Christchurch psychological operation. Okay. So are we talking about the Russian political an analyst? Yes. So it says here, Alexander Dugan is a Russian political analyst and strat strategist known for his fascist views. He has close ties with the Kremlin and the Russian military, having served as an advisor to State Duma Speaker Gennady Selesnyov and a key member of the ruling United Russia Party, Sergei Nareshkin. Okay, so he, oh yeah, he's a modern guy, he's 57. Okay, so he has the, okay, that's right, the fourth political theory. That's what Masaki and I were talking about. The fourth political theory, that's his whole thing. Mind games, yeah, Alexander Dugan and Russia's war of ideas. Gotcha. Okay, now, yeah, I know who you're talking about now. Yeah. So since so we're on the topic of movies, there's a really interesting movie with Kevin Costner called uh, No Way Out. I, and it, right? yeah. have you seen it? I feel like I saw it back then. So, um, one of the interesting components is that uh, there's, there, he, play, he plays a naval officer. And one of the interesting components is that he winds up having an affair with uh, Sean Young. Okay. And Sean Young, you know, admittedly came out a couple of years ago talking about mind control. Yeah. And talking about how she was, you know, kind of part of that world. Yep. And in that movie, she plays an escort who is connected to Gene Hackman. I remember this now, yeah. So, so, so what happens, this is really fascinating, is that Kevin Costner theoretically plays this American soldier, naval officer, decorated hero, et cetera, et cetera. And then things go wrong inside the Pentagon because there's this murder of Sean Young and it's connected to Gene Hackman's character. So what happens is, is that they concoct this story that there is a Russian who has infiltrated the Pentagon and his name is Yuri. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to find him. So this, this movie is a cat and mouse game with trying to find this guy, Yuri. But now they want to pin the Yuri character on Kevin Costner because he's the one that they want to take down because he knows too much. He knows about this murder. Well, at the end of the movie, ironically, you find out Kevin Costner is Yuri. So the whole thing is kind of layered, right? It's hidden in plain sight. And, I, and again, I think it's a little bit of predictive programming in mm -hmm. terms of the infiltration mm -hmm. of Russia. And I think the infiltration of Russia is fairly significant. Yeah. Do I do. And I think the it's not collusion, it's infiltration. That, that, that's what I'm saying. The Russian, they, they, it's great. It's a great cover for infiltration is to have this collusion thing. I mean, I have no, I, I don't think that Putin's a great guy. I don't think Donald Trump is a great guy. And this has all become about like, oh, Trump is a great president, blah, blah, blah. And then it, every, all of this stuff is like the sheen on top, like a layer on top. Meanwhile, the infection is festering, bubbling underneath here. And, you know, to the, you know, and I think the Democrats and the Republicans and all, they're all in on it together, right? And they're creating this, you know, dog and pony show, this circus side show that everybody, you know, this is what I want to know. No, what the hell has been going on in the world for the last three years that everybody has missed because all we've been hearing are three words, Trump, Russia, and collusion, right? Like there could be, you know, worlds, and there could be, I mean, even you and I consider ourselves fairly well informed, but this has been so distracting that even if you don't care about this, you have to hear it. You know, your brain can only hold so many words a day, right? Like during this period of time, I've become a lot less interested in information. I pay a lot less information to, in, in, uh, a lot less attention to things than I used to. And, you know, I don't know if it's just because I saturated myself with information and I'm tired of it. Or if like I saw enough that like it's all just different versions of the same thing anymore and that got boring to me. Or if even though I don't buy any of this kind of crap, just being exposed to the environment that it created has somehow, you know, 
dissuaded me from information as well. Whatever is going on, you know, there's stuff that we should probably be paying attention to that we're not paying attention to. And that is part of the art of demoralization, infiltration, distraction, all of this kind of stuff. Everybody is talking about something that really has probably nothing to do with anything, you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. Like, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, the Russian infiltration happened in our academic system largely, right? It's been happening through corporations, through through uh, the academics and whatnot. Whether people who are involved in it understand it as Russian or not, it's certainly, you know, communist in nature. Right, right. Well, clearly, I mean, you know, what they're, what they're dealing with in colleges or what they're being dealt is the Frankfurt School and identity yeah. politics and um, this, this, you know, kind of first wave sort of psychological socialism. And, you know, in the Frankfurt School, they were put together to basically, you know, change the polemic and, and, and take down uh, capitalism in the West. I mean, that was, that was their role. I mean, and, it's Bolshevism, it's Frankfurt School, it's all this kind of, you know, it's, we're, we have, a, it, you know, this is the thing is that what we're dealing with on every level here is hybrid kind of stuff, right? Like all these events we're seeing, we don't have, false flags or hoaxes or, or psyops anymore. We have these weird combination buffet tray, you know, table kind of hybrid events. And the same thing goes for like all of this political kind of stuff. Like everyone's like, oh, we're looking, that's not communism, that's not socialism, that's not fascism. We're getting some weird blend with all of the most, you know, effective parts of each one of them, right? Including capitalism, right? You know, so they're taking like the methods that are best for control and you know stripping people of their individuality and their own personal power they're taking all those methods and combining them together to you know it, but people don't understand that people are looking for you know the, you know pure communism or pure socialism and, and that stuff doesn't exist anymore everything is you know fusion right it's like cuisine everything is fusion these days there's no you can't just go to a chinese restaurant anymore right <laughs> right yeah it's true yeah. um yeah, that's that's absolutely right. If you if you look at the uh, the neocons, you know the neocons come out of you know Leo Strauss and Irving Kristol, and those guys were dyed in the wool commies. I mean, they were hardline left leaning Bolsheviks. That's who they were, mm -hmm. and some of them came out of sort of the you know the, the, the Trotsky nest yep. in, in Mexico. Yeah. And so they're Trotskyites and they come to the United States and they realize that politically their brand of, of ideology is not going to go down well. So what do they do? They rebrand themselves and they rebrand themselves as the neocons. And then they begin to attach themselves to people like Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, yeah. George Bush. Well, that, isn't that what they do? That's what's so interesting here is that we have basically, so like, the left has always like made fun of the McCarthyism with the Republicans that went on, you know, back last round. And, and, and that, by the way, is a specific tactic. Right. And now, but now they're, they're doing the same thing, right? That like literally it's the same red scare, the same Russian, you know, scare all over again, but from the different side. And that's when, you know, you really have people lost and confused, right? You've swung them side to side so many times that you now have the left, behaving like exactly the people that they made fun of 30, 40 years ago. Right, exactly. Yep, yeah, yeah. And it was it was a canard, right? Yeah. It was thought to be a canard because people, you know, oh, poo-poo communism. Oh, that was ridiculous, the Red Scare. Oh, it doesn't, no, you know, I mean, what happened was is once, you know, once they threw a few bodies out there and sacrificed a few screenwriters and a couple of singers, yeah. right? It was like, okay, we, you know, we took care of that. We shut it down. No, what they did is they just, they just, you know, it was, it was kind of this revelation of the method. They gave a little bit of truth yeah. and then they said, okay, let's move forward and continue this. Yeah. And let's continue this demoralization process, which really takes root in the 1970s mm -hmm. and Watergate and Vietnam and all that stuff that's connected to mm -hmm. generations that are growing up and looking for, you know, models and ideals of inspiration and vision, et cetera, it just all comes crashing down. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and I was a young kid. I was 13, 14 years old. And I was, I was obsessed with Watergate. You know, I was obsessed with Nixon. And I have to say that, that, you know, I became way more cynical after that. 
So their program worked on me. Yeah. You know, I became much more disenfranchised. You know, I was less kind of pro-American, uh, you know, more sort of, you know, shifting, <laughs> literally, see? literally shifting my consciousness so that I could take on more of a drugged up, drugged out Tim Leary kind of reality. The That's same, what happened. The same thing. I would never have considered myself um, pro-American. -America, I've never been like one of these people who's like, you know, yeehaw America. But yeah. Whatever they did during the George Bush years, just like what they did during the Nixon years, made me at times embarrassed to be an American, right? And also led me into the underground and counterculture, which there are some great things about that, but there's the, the, there's a mind control program there too, right? Are you, talk, are you talking Bush 2? Bush 2? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Bush 2 was a big demoralization program. Yeah. Massive. I mean, I was embarrassed Massive. to, get, you know, I was embarrassed to be an American dur at times during that, you know? And so yeah. it made me... So, you know, I was, I've always been a counterculture underground kind of person, but it pushed me really deep, right? Which there's some amazing things to be there, but there's also a mind control program waiting for you there. And that one is in some ways, even a deeper, darker mind control program. And so, you know, that's what, you know, we're just in like, we're in, you know, I'd say seven layer cake, but it's many more layers than seven. And in each layer, the th frosting is thicker and sweeter and harder to get out of. Yeah, I agree. I, yeah. I totally agree. Think about Abu Ghraib. What a demoralization program that was. Yeah. My cat is driving me nuts. Hold on a second. Olivia, get out. Sorry. Go. Go. Sorry, everybody. Robert and I, uh, Robert and I are both controlled by our cats. So, you know. <laughs> I, think you, I think you a little more than me. Well, I have just one. So I just have one boss, you have three bosses, so you can get away with shit, you know, while you're there fighting for who has control, you know? Right. I just yeah, have no. a big boss, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, J Jasper and Rosie have their own kind of dynamic, right? They kind, they kind, it's kind of a check and balance system with them. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, so. You have a third okay. cat though too, don't you? No, no, just Jasper and Rosie. Why do you think you had three? Okay, yeah, one more cat and you're a cat lady, you know, so. I'm, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm really avoiding <laughs> the, the third cat, trust me. Um, yeah, the only yeah. cat I've ever had. I'm probably the only cat I'll ever have, and I love her dearly. But yes, I'm, um, I'm too much of an anarchist to, to continue to live with cats. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you know, what, what, what's the same cats own you? Cat, you know, and yeah, the, the dogs have owners, cats have staff. That's right. That's yeah. very good. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't like working for other people. <laughs> so Abu Ghraib was a huge demoralization program, yeah. you know, because because that was trauma layered upon trauma. We had 9-11, uh, you know, everything that went, you know, just came out of 9-11. Mm -hmm. And then there was all this goodwill towards Americans. Oh, my God, what could happen to the Americans? You know, oh, they've been assholes, but, you know, let's, let's have some empathy. And then, boom, the Abu Ghraib pictures yeah. hit. And man, are they dark? Um, are they sinister? Right? And as an American, what do you, how do you feel about that? You feel really crappy that we're treating people in this fashion. Mm -hmm. And if you're somebody who's not American, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you motherfuckers, you didn't learn your lesson, did you? Look at you. Yeah. So it's ongoing. The demoralization program is constant. constant. It is constant. And every once in a while, you'll get something that you think is, oh, here's a, here's, you know, a ray of sunshine, a ray of hope, which then just leads you into another, you know, off into another pocket universe of, you know, you know, like, for, you know, there was a moment for a few seconds that a lot of us fell for, you know, Obama. I mean, I fell for, you know, I voted for Obama in 2008, right? Within three months of, of him being inaugurated, I had moved from being very far left to basically being, you know, I'd gone through the sort of uh, libertarian phase and made it all the way to anarchist within three months because that was so demoralizing. I realized, you know, pretty quickly. But that day, I was there in Washington, D.C., the day he was inaugurated because my sister lived there. And the energy and the hope that was in the streets was palpable, right? Like sure. people thought, that, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe things are going to be okay. And then just all of those hopes dashed. Right. And for some people, they keep drinking the Kool-Aid. But for me, it was like, you know, shit, this world is crazy. And, you know, not not only did we get another crappy president, but like this one who seemed like he was better than all the other ones is actually far worse in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? It was just like 
and to me that you know that that just I mean, I was done with politics and I haven't voted since then, you know, like I figured it out. So for me, it was a wake up call. But if, you know, people weren't so inclined to do research and to really get to the bottom of something, it could just be demoralizing and not in any way. I yeah, I saw Obama a mile away. Mm. I knew it was coming. <laughs> it was just like, oh, man, this guy's bad news. Yeah, it's really bad news. And then the books came out, the connections to Ayers and you know, there, there was just so much, so much going on. There was so much backstory. There was yeah. so much heat on the bone with yeah. Obama that if you really wanted to dig yeah. in, man, you would the find moment, stuff. The moment, start, the moment I started to look, I just didn't look in. It was just like, okay, he sounded, you know, like I was not, I was already at that point awake to, um, you know, like 9-11 a bit and the mind control stuff on a certain level. I hadn't really looked a lot at politics you know what I mean? Like I was just in, you know, I knew a little bit about the, I knew about the chemtrails and whatnot, you know, but, um, you know, I guess I started having my big wake up in like 2005. Right. But I hadn't really started looking at, you know, I mean, I knew because it was just, I thought George Bush was an idiot. So a lot of it was just about George Bush for me. Right. Right. So Obama seemed better. And, you know, I, you know, that just wasn't where my attention was at as far as the research or conspiracy or whatever. But literally, I, I mean, I think within two weeks of getting home from that inauguration, I was like, so I, I fell across something, something's funny here. And yeah, the moment I went looking for anything, you could find, I mean, the stack is thick. It doesn't, I mean, there's no, you know, like on, on Obama, you know, like there's, you could, I mean, those were some of the most interesting times, those early, you know, between like 2008 and 2011, the things that were being uncovered about Obama after he was- Oh, yeah. Him. There was just- yeah. There was, yeah. so, there was so much meat on the bone, like yeah. his, his relationship with Tony Resco mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, Tony Resco basically being uh, a slumlord yeah. uh, in Chicago and, and Resco setting the Obamas up with a really nice place, low interest loan. Uh, Michelle was working at a law firm. Resco was getting all these sweetheart deals. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, that's just kind of, you know. There are so many, I mean, whether your thing is strictly politics or mind control or way off into like secret space kind of stuff or, you know, whatever, secret homosexual kind of stuff or whatever. Oh, like, whatever. it's all there. I mean, he's, he's a Manchurian candidate, CIA groomed. Uh, and, and you want to talk about a Russia connection. Right. Yeah. So Obama. You know, so, so I don't know if you know the little, this. The little Medvedev thing when he was like, you know. Oh, he, he, and, Medvedev, he and Medvedev know each other. Yeah. They, they like, you know, they're really familiar, if you know what I'm saying. They were in the same communist kindergarten or whatever, yeah. So there's a really interesting um, story that's been on the internet for a while. And, you know, going back to that time, and it's, you know, anonymous sources, but it's really kind of juicy and interesting. What's and it? It's, it's, it's a story where this is guy who's talking about a night in Russia yeah. after the wall fell and he's having yeah. dinner and, you know, they're having drinks. And, and the woman and, is like, this guy is going to be the next president. And this woman basically goes off and, yeah. and, says, and says, you know, you're going to have a president that was educated in Russia. Russia. Yeah. And, he, and he's, and what did she say? She called him a tar baby or something like that. It was yeah. pretty, pretty. Red you know, diaper baby. Yeah, well, yeah, but she was also talking about the complexion of the skin. Oh, okay. Like that he was black. Yeah. And, and he's basically saying that you're not even going to notice this. He's going to become president and he's one of ours. Yep. Yeah. So, so you want to talk about Russia collusion. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Barry Sotero. Right. Not Because he was, he was, he is a red diaper baby. His his grandfather was was a red. His yeah. mother was a spook for the CIA. Yeah. That hit from both sides. Then there's a relationship with Frank Marshall Davis. Yeah. He becomes his handler. And Frank Marshall Davis was a hardcore member of CPUSA. Yeah. And, you know, and he had his, you know, his dirty novels and his dirty pictures. And you know, this is this is where Obama gets initiated. Yeah. So, so he was he was guided every step of the way, and and it was the path was always towards the left with Obama. Yep. So if you want to, if you want to dive into some Russian collusion, some communist collusion, like, like, that's your guy right there. Right. So you know, 
think about this. It's really interesting tactic, right? If you're doing this infiltration and creating the dog and pony, dog and pony show and everybody like, mm, mm, Obama has really way more obvious Russian ties than, than Trump does. It's a redirection. But right, but it could literally be like that they're on some level, whether known to them, it's been known, whether it's known to them or not, Russian agents, right? And so, like you know, the fact that you know there's something seemingly more Russian about Trump than there was about Obama is an insane notion. But you know, th that's what they do. Like, you know, like they make the most the most insane story at this point is the one that's true. <laughs> Well, especially if it's repeated again. We want all Russian presidents, you know that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, I think that, that we're really kind of in the thick of this now. Mm -hmm. And what, what we're, we're looking at or what we're trying to untangle is this surface layer kind of noise, mm -hmm. which, which is, you know, really splitting people, splitting people in two, right? And it's not just... It's not just splitting people in two, but the Russia thing is splitting people in two in every, I, and I thought about this, every single sector of society is being split in two. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about what's going on with the Jewish community mm -hmm. and what's happening with Israel, Netanyahu and Jared Kushner and Trump and Chabad Lubavitch and, you know, all this really kind of entrenched re relationships in networks well, and even, even in the alternative media right now it's like are you a uh cgi hoaxer or are you a mind control black ops psyopser right like right you no know, that kind of, yeah so so i i think moving forward the jewish that community is, can, can have a very is, hard time right yeah a really hard time because yeah. what's happening now also is that you know people are starting to kind of wake up and, and look at systems of control, yep. okay? And, you know, whether you think it's a cliche or not, if you drill down into who the CEOs of these various companies are, there's probably a really good chance at a high level, they're mostly Jewish, okay? Yep. And, and people, and this is a fact, and people are now starting to put these pieces together, and they're saying, if our reality is scripted, who's scripting the reality? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is going to be... This is going to be kind of a major talking point and a major dilemma moving forward. And every now and then, they have sacrificial lambs, right? Yeah. Now, the latest sacrificial lamb was uh, our friend at uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah, in the Southern po Morris Dees. Morris Dees, right? So, so it's like, you know, let's cut the head off here. And, you know, let's, let's give this to the masses, right? Let's yeah. let them chew on this for a while. Mm -hmm. saying, well, and, and, and Hollywood gave up Harvey Weinstein a couple of years exactly, ago. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Bernie Badoff, when it came to mm -hmm. sort of the finance thing, right? Uh, Louis Libby, when it came to sort of the neocon connection yeah. inside, of the, inside of the Bush administration. Yeah. So, so there, you know, there are these sacrifices. Like, you know, different communities will eat their own. And that's just the way it is. You know, and, 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 and it happens all the time. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, I'm seeing that there's gonna be a split in that community. There's already a split in the white community between you know, people of, that, are, that are progressive or liberal, you know, more conservative, more truthy. There's a split right down the middle there. You're gonna to start to see a split in the, in the African American community, black community. Or the whole Brexit thing and yeah, all that kind of, yeah. Right, so, so it's really fascinating because at one point we were dealing with like white versus black, right? Uh, you know, gay versus straight, you know, really simple denominations. Well, even those now are getting split. Look at what's happening in the, in the LGBTQ and the transgender community, right? right? Like, the, like on the lesbian side of things, you know, they're not really happy with the transgender world and vice versa. And the feminists don't like any of it. And yeah, it's all, yeah. Right. So now we're, now we're getting into multiples of splits. Mm -hmm. And it used to just be kind of factional, now it's fractional. The intersectionality at this point reminds me of like, have you ever seen any of those stoplights that also have a diagonal crosswalk, right? You have everybody coming from every angle. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Intersectionality has become, you know, so you now, yeah, yeah. So, so we're staring down kind of the, mic, the, the micronization of, of these fractal relationships where communities are split apart. Mm-hmm. 
And it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I mean, really what they're doing is just creating a, a kind of a massive network of confusion. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to your point, getting back to, well, what's been going on while we've all been, you know, drooling in front of the TV, so well, not all of us, you know, waiting for that moment, that kind of Pavlovian moment, you know, where it's like, yeah, we got him, you know, and it didn't happen. You know, on the other side, there's a Hillary Clinton version of that too, right? Totally. Yeah. So, but what's been going on? My, my, my and feeling. There was that with Obama too. Everybody was waiting for the day that Joe Arpaio yes. would have his his uh, yeah. press conference, and they right. put the birth certificate wasn't real, and blah blah blah. There's yeah. always that, and it never happens. And so, for me, and and this is always the option. Like, it's really really funny if you turn your TV off and you turn your internet off for a couple of days and just go to you. All this stuff goes away. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't exist, does it, really? Yeah, it's amazing how it only exists if we turn it on, and that's the point. Getting people to tune in and focus their energy on this reality, this one that's being psychically driven, doesn't even actually exist if you just turn it off. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some truth to that. And the paradox is that things are happening. And, yeah. that, and, that, and that there can be, theoretically, more civil liberties taken away from us. Mm -hmm you know, more mind control, yeah. um, you know, competing systems, globalism versus this kind of- But are we actually creating those things by paying attention? Right, right, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, I, and I will say, I will say that they will invest in whatever model mm -hmm. that they think is going to be the one that will give them the greatest amount of control at the end yeah. of the day. So, Absolutely. so, so those models, so, I mean, we're in a really interesting period of history and time. Now, getting back to your question about what's been going on. Yeah. All this has been happening. I think it has to do with Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, smart cities, smart technologies. They're rolling this stuff out right underneath our noses. Yeah. And people aren't asking the right questions. They're not paying attention. You know, and at some point, they're going to flip the switch and things are going to go south. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it'll be disruption with uh, utilities, disruption with services, disruption with economies, and then, 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 oh, the burden, the burden of taking care of people in these outer lying areas that has to stop. We can't afford this anymore. Right. You know, we've got to bring people into these centralized areas where we're going to allocate resources because that's what we can afford. Yeah. Right? That's what, that's beginning to take place. And pay attention now to technology failing. This is, this, you know, and we just saw a wave of this happening during, during the Mercury retrograde. Mm -hmm. Facebook went down. People had weird stuff happening where they're well. I had a spade of stuff going on with my stuff, right? So some of this is going to be engineered. Yeah. We're, we're going to see basically the, 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 uh, the phantom failure of the existing technological infrastructure. And right. what will happen is that they're going to say, "Well, guess what? We we have we have the we have the answer to that. It's, it's you know it's five G. It's these smart networks. Just get on board, right? Just get on board now, and it's going to solve all these issues. But they're having problems because people are waking up to five G. They're finding that there are some severe health issues with five G. So this is going." <laughs> You hear this insane, my friend Derek Rose, I had a, he had a video where he's talking about there's these people who are like QAnon people who are talking about how, oh, it's okay because Trump made, made 5G safe. Like the version, he, the reason why Trump says that we need to get it first is because if the others get it first, and they're, they're the ones who are going to do the unsafe mind control one. But Trump has made sure that this 5G we're all getting, it's good for us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 edge I, of wonder or something like that. It's like Trump, you know, Trump is the savior. In fact, he even, you know, made made five G safe. <laughs> you know, there there are people who follow Q, and I love them dearly. You know, they're good people. Um, they're they're really invested in a better world. Um, so I, I don't dismiss some of these people, oh, but at the same time, critical thinking. And just really following some of this evidence. It's like the same thing that's happened with the liberals with this Trump Russia thing, right? People who there's people who believe the QAnon nonsense, who I call it the QAnon nonsense, who like in the years prior to that 
have gotten really far into taking responsibility for themselves, reclaiming their own lives, becoming active in this and that, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden QAnon comes out and says, don't worry, everything's fine. Just have trust in the plan. And all of a sudden these people are, you know, not doing anything anymore. And they're just sitting there watching Q videos and researching Q posts and not actually doing anything anymore. These are people who at one time were bordering on becoming, you know, voluntarist, anarchist, or libertarian, and now they fully believe in Republican government again. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so think there's, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Look, I think there are some things, too, that Trump has been initially very successful and useful with. Mm -hmm. First of all, he didn't sign the TPP. I mean, that was great. Yeah. I, mean, I think that was before they got their hooks in them. Yep. Okay. Uh, and I think the, the, the two greatest things that Trump has done since he's president is, number one, he's busted the, the political correctness spell. To me, that's the only thing that matters. He, he busted the PC yeah. spell. And the other thing, he, he, which is sort of like tangential to that, is um, his whole idea around fake news and propaganda. Right. That's, he, he's upset the apple cart. And for that purpose, yeah, I mean, uh, and you know, th that to me has been his most important function. I, totally. I believe all these guys are criminals. I don't believe in government. I don't want him for president or anyone else. But the role that he's played that I can appreciate is he has upset the shit out of the apple cart. That's for damn sure. And On that's what he was supposed level, to do. He's a disruptor. Right. On a certain level. But part of the part of that disruption was also part of the distraction. So business as usual happens underneath that. Everybody's paying attention to the noise up here. The machine is still moving underneath. That's so true. we have to be careful of that too. Yeah. yeah it's true. Um, but you know, I'll just, I'll just tip my cap to that sort of piece around the Trump presidency. Yeah. The other stuff, I, you know, we don't have enough time uh, yeah. to go, to go through it all. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're living in very interesting times. You know, I've been watching these two commercials. Well, they're, they're, they're fascinating, okay? I just made the connection today because I saw sort of the, it's kind of, it's, it's a companion commercial, but they're run by different companies. So Dell has, what's his name? Jeffrey Wright as their spokesperson. Do you know Jeffrey Wright? He's an actor. Uh, African American. Oh, no. He's in West World. He's in West World. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. With the T, separated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He plays Basquiat. Yeah. In the movie. Yeah. So, so he is a spokesperson for Dell, and Dell is running these commercials about this kind of hybridization and fusion kind of uh, sort of technology. Like, they're studying how manta rays work and then applying it to flying. Yeah. Stuff like that, right? So, so they're using him as a spokesperson. Well-spoken, articulate, actor, black male, right? Then I believe it's IBM, if I'm not mistaken, is using Common, the hip-hop guy, to do the same thing. Mm. It's like they're both selling this version of the future. Mm -hmm. they're, they're both selling this kind of, you know, tech, techno, slightly technocratic or techno-infused smart society. So they're, they're the new Dr. Ewan Cameron. They're the new ambassadors of technophilia. Yeah, that's right. You know, and Common comes out of Chicago, and he's a hip-hop guy. And yeah, you know who Common used to date, don't you? Uh, I think so. Who was it? Serena Williams. Oh, Serena Williams. Oh, yeah, I didn't know. I knew it. No, I didn't know he dated her. He, That's interesting. He, he was dating her, for, like, she had been very successful for a number of years and then had sort of, like, lost interest in tennis and would just kind of, like, was more interested in fashion and would show up at the majors fat and out of shape. And sometimes she would play well and sometimes she wouldn't and blah, blah, blah. And then during the period of time that she was dating him, she seemed to become much more focused and driven about tennis again, right? So it was, it's kind of interesting. And then, you know, he was a very – he's a very clean living kind of guy. And then, you know, they broke up and moved on and moved on. But I – to me, that was an interesting pairing, and, and you know, yeah. So, so you know, and we've documented ad nauseum here our thoughts about Serena Williams, and it's interesting she has that crossover with, with um, uh, with Common. But so yeah. Here, so here's the question. So we have Jeffrey Wright, who's you know kind of he's an actor, a thespian, very articulate, highbrow. Mm -hmm. We have Common, who's well, he's Common, right? Yeah. He's of the people. Yeah, you know, he's, he's you know he, streets of Chicago. Yeah, 
hip hop. These are the guys that are pushing the future. Mm -hmm. All right. So, so they're polarized uh -huh. in some ways. Um, now, let me ask you a question. Why don't they have two really smart, articulate white guys pushing their vision of the future? Right. Because that, 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 you know, that's not the future, right? So the future. Well, it's not the future. And by the way, you don't trust Whitey. Right. Yeah. There's, it's also, you know, I, I can't stand all of these, um, the future is female shirts, right? And the force is female. It's like, yeah, you're going to see everybody but white, straight, Christian males in those roles. You're going to see, you know, but, and, and, you know, I, I, I have no problem with that when it's like at a level that's representative of the reality in society. But when all, you know, remember like in, in the eighties, the late seventies and early eighties, when suddenly all the news anchors were Asian women, like Connie Chung and oh, Trisha, right. Trisha Toyota, Trisha Toyota and Connie yeah. Chung and all that. Right. Sure, yeah. and, you know, it's like that kind of thing. It's like, you know, and I guess we first started to see this with like James Earl Jones and Samuel Jackson, when they started doing all the commercials, they got all those like very catchy commercials and, yeah, it's kind of, it is interesting, but yeah, you're not you're not going to see straight white, you know, si you know, Christian men as spokes spokespeople anymore at all. No, no, it's it's, it's not happening because yeah. because number one, um, there's no there's theoretically no no empathy or trust. Right. You know, and, and you'd have to go and find like Bill Nye. He's just a goofy son of a bitch. Right. And, you you know he can't sell the future. So what we're looking at is, is, is a virtue signal from the future. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, we're, we're in this, we're right now we are in weird levels of virtue signaling. Yeah. You know, you know so this whole thing with Ocasio Cortez and the code switching, have you been following that at all? No. Oh my God. Okay. So I think it was on Sunday. She, she spoke at an event that was sponsored by um, Al oh, Sharpton. He, like used a fake black accent or some shit. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's the worst kind of affectation I've ever heard in my life, right? And, and if, <laughs> is, it, is it worse than when Hillary Clinton said she liked hot sauce? <laughs> I ain't no tired now. Remember she said that? She, she was on tour and she was in the South and she made herself sound Southern. And it was completely yeah. ridiculous. Anyway, if I was black, I'd be insulted. It's like, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're mangling, you know, our language, our dialect. You're insulting me. But, you, of course, the left has to come to her, her aid and say, oh, no, that's code switching. <laughs> what the heck is code switching? Yeah, code switching. So code switching is apparently what people do when they have to move through various levels layers and sectors of society oh so somebody who happens to be black or african-american when they're at work they have a certain affectation because they need to you know put on a chameleon mask and then blend in right but then after work and they're hanging out this sounds like mind control also this sounds uh, I, I think it's totally disassociative right it sounds like switching alters it sounds like you know you totally. walk yeah yeah, total mind control. And so, so, so code switching. It, yeah. you know, that, it, it, this has been an interesting week with the virtue signal. Mm. Yeah, and we have Candace Owens, who is on Capitol Hill today. Right. And um, she was having to answer this thing about, you know, loving Hitler. I did like how fiery she was. but oh, she's, Yeah, she's good at that. She's, she's smart and she's fiery and stuff like that, but she's pushing just another another brand of slightly less stinky bullshit than everybody else is pushing. And she's does the whole super conservative in love with Israel crap. And, and, and to me, she's just, um, she's a Condoleezza Rice with street cred. <laughs> right? uh, when, you came, when you came up with that, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. And I, I, I would totally agree. And you know, one of the things that she said in her meeting with this guy, Ted Lou, mm -hmm. um, anyway. that guy made a total ass of himself. Yeah. Yeah, he, he held up this and he took it out of context and you know it's just but he just sat there when she he just sat there looking like a goon when she called him out he, on what's he gonna do i mean you know this is what this is what the left does they don't answer to anything no 
they just remain right. quiet. They're, 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 right. They're, but they're, they're right because they're on the right side of all of this. So they don't ever have to have facts or get their, their facts straight or, or give the context for things. They're nice people. So right. it's okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So, so, you know, her virtue signal is that she teaches at a university in Israel and uh, she's, you know, has a lot of respect and love and comradeship and loyalty to Israel. And, it, and it's almost like that's your passport to free speech. You know, you, if you have that stamped, you know, that's, that's, that's your bona fide. Yeah. And, and now you can begin to, you know, speak freely or approximate the truth. But no, never get close to that third rail or else you'll get that, you get it yanked away. Yeah. So it's, 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 again, it gets into this whole idea that, that now nationalism is tied into Zionism and the coup, you know, and, it, and it's like, if you're, if you're, if you're going to be nationalistic, if you're going to support the United States, if you're going to be into this idea of a country, well, you got to wrap your arm around, right. you know, Israel, if you know, but guess what? You're over on the left now. And this is hilarious because, and this goes to the same thing that I kept telling, saying that they were doing with the alt-right, alt-light stuff. They're trying to paint, the people they're trying to paint as white nationalists are really just conservatives who love, who love Israel, right? The people who are actually white nationalists, they have no love for Israel and they wouldn't want anybody to know about them, just like the alt-right and the alt-light, right? The people that they were saying were alt-right were not, they were alt-light because they don't want people to actually hear what these people are saying, right? Because there is, you know, like, and this is, you know, this is not anti-Semitic or a statement against Jewish people. I am a Jewish person, right? There's something wrong with Zionism and with the politics of the state of Israel. And it is not anti-Semitic to say that. And it's not a lie. That is the truth to say that, it's right? political ideology. Yeah. It's what yeah. it is. And it was adopted. Yeah. So anyway, that, that's kind of another version of the virtue signal. Yeah. You know, it's a virtual signal going in a different direction. It's establishing virtue or virtuous relationship with a place that theoretically holds a great deal of gravity and import. You know, and it's kind of like, you know, I'm with them over there. I'm with don't, them, so I'm safe. Right, right Don't mess with them. They've got yeah. my back, okay? Yeah. Uh, so that's been happening, and then we have Kyle Corver, who plays for the uh, Utah Jazz. He just came out with a big manifesto about white privilege and what it's like to, you know, be white in this country and you know play basketball. And white? Kyle Corver's white. He's. he's okay, I don't know anything about this one. So yeah. He's a, he's a white boy, and and I thought it was. I thought you know, um, Jason Whitlock did a, an absolutely great breakdown. I like Jason Whitlock, yeah. Jason Whitlock is pretty clear. And, and he basically said, look, you know, he found it insulting. He said, nowhere in there are there any solutions. Nowhere in there is there any kind of roadmap to getting to a better place for the black community. And by the way, you're not even black. We don't need a white savior to come in and solve our problems. You know, and, and he says the woke people love the white savior. Right, and, and, and it was like, he put it really in a very interesting perspective. Yeah. And, and then I thought it was really ironic because if you look at the NBA, it's probably about 90% black. Mm -hmm. And Kyle Korver happens to be white, so-called white. So in some ways, he is experiencing a white privilege because he can play in the freaking NBA. <laughs> That's the most ironic part about it. Right. So this is the week of the virtue signal. Yeah. And the virtue signal is probably kind of an offshoot of a psychic driving program as well. Mm -hmm. So that it can reformulate us to think along politically correct terms yep. and not begin to, uh, you know, embrace ideas that are dangerous, mm -hmm. thoughts that are dangerous, yep. truths that are dangerous. Yep. Meant to pen us in. If you hear something, if you hear an idea over and over and over and over, it's not dangerous. You're not getting close to the truth with that, right? So if you're hearing the same words repeated over and over and over, turn it off. Off. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. the, the dangerous idea, the one that leads to truth, is just like the healthiest item in the in the grocery store. You're gonna have to go to like the very corner in the back under like the dusty stuff where it's hidden by something. That's where you're gonna find it. It's not gonna be repeated over and over and over on the mainstream news. Right, unless you and I are repeating it, then it's truth. <laughs> All right. Yes, we're not psychic divers. We're psychic divers. <laughs> so we've come full circle now. We've done the full psychic dive. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything else you have before we wrap up? I'm getting hungry. Yeah, me too. You know, I mean, I just wanted to get back to kind of the astrological thing oh, yeah. for, just, for just a minute, because sure. when you and I were talking about this and... Before we, oh, the, know, best part, the best part of the show always happens before the show. We have to hit record as soon as we start talking. <laughs> I know, right? So, so, so um, you and Cameron really begins to work on his model in 1943. Yeah. And 1943 is a weird time because it's kind of in the thick of World War II. You know, there's stuff going on in the Pacific. Uh, you know, the Russians are fighting the Germans. Mussolini is captured. So, we're, and, you know, the whole concentration camp thing is starting to, you know, proliferate and, you know, begin to gain some traction. So, 43 is an interesting time, but it's also when Uranus goes into the sign of Gemini. And Cameron is right there, you know, at, at the at the starting gate of all of this. Of course, Uranus, yeah. Uranus is technological and Gemini is about the split. And, and then Saturn is conjuncting Uranus at that time. So they're trying to find ultimately mainstream applications, which is what Saturn is. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a fascinating time. And another, one of the other Saturn cycles is every 30 years. So one of the other Saturn cycles that comes out of that uh, winds up being um, right around 1971, 72, 73, right around there. That's Watergate. Yeah. Very and then the next Saturn in, in Gemini cycle is guess when? 9-11. Right. Wow. Yeah. Which is also the Gemini, the split. The Gemini. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. All right. So it takes us back full circle. Dr. Cameron, technology and the split. That's what Don, we're experiencing right now. Donald Cameron, Donald Ewing Cameron. Yeah. Yep. yeah All right, guys. Yeah. So maybe you'll listen to this psychic drive on your psychic drive, <laughs> right? While you're psychic driving, you're psychic diving. But Robert, it's been great to do another show with you. We'll be back sooner this time than we were last time. And uh, you can find Robert at robertphoenix.com. Go get your reading. It's, it, it's a good one, I promise. You can find me at Off Planet Radio, offplanetradio.com. And if you'd like a health or wellness consultation, hit me up on Facebook at Emily Moyer, and we will see you next time. Peace Thanks, out. Emily. All righty. Cool. Wait. Stop the cool. Yeah. Stop.